Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and we've got in front of us another half hour of libertarian conversation. My guest tonight is Frederick Cookenham, the author of The Age of Rand, Imagining an Objectivist Future World. So, Frederick, the obvious first question is, who is Rand? And is her age now or in the future or during her lifetime? <laughs> Well, her age was 77 when she died in 1982. Uh, she was an author. Uh, she is best known as the author of the novels The Fountainhead, 1943, and Atlas Shrugged, 1957. And her first name, of course, is A-Y-N. A-Y-N. Some people say Ann, some people say Ein. <coughs> um, yes, in her thick Russian accent, she used to say it's pronounced Ein that rhymes with swine. Okay. And that's for those people who don't think that she had a sense of humor one of the many myths about Rand. And Ein was actually her nickname, as I understand. It was a made-up name. Uh, there are two uh, stories um, uh, about where it came from. One is that it was the name of, or a form of the name of a, of a Finnish writer that she liked uh, as a girl. And uh, the other story is that it was a name that her father gave her uh, that came from the Hebrew word for eye. Yes, she, had she had big, very big eyes, eyes, very prominent eyes. Okay. Now, um, when people mention the name Ayn Rand, it usually elicits a reaction of some kind. Either oh, yes. people will say, oh my God, I love her, I love everything she's written. Mm -hmm. Other people will say, oh, what an evil, horrible person. Yep. Which is it, and why do people <laughs> have such strong reactions? They have that reaction because she was a moralist. Uh, she decided at a very early age that she wanted to be a writer, and she took her job very seriously and decided that if she was going to write novels about people, she ought to make her own decisions about what she thought about the great questions about philosophy in general and morality or ethics in particular. Uh, she went way beyond the call of duty in that and by the end of her life she had um, developed an entire philosophical system. Uh, the most um, startling feature of which is, is her ethics. Uh, she was an advocate of what she called rational self-interest or rational selfishness or Sometimes she just used the word self-esteem. Uh, this uh, goes contrary to what you and I and everybody in every culture and every religion was brought up to believe. Uh, and Which is that you should that, live for others. Eh? That you should do for anybody and everybody but yourself. Right. And she said that was wrong. And she made a case and uh, she expressed that case not only um, clearly and logically in her nonfiction, but she expressed it in novels, which is very, very powerful because there are a lot of people out there who read her novels just like they would read any other novel. Uh, okay. But those are the people who keep her books in print in the millions and then they're picked up by intellectually curious and adventurous people uh, like libertarians who are interested always in the, the farthest out cutting edge ideas in any area. Okay, now would Ayn Rand have known the word libertarian or would she have used it? Yes. Uh, Interestingly enough, according to her first biographer, Barbara Brandon, um, when Ayn became um, a naturalized citizen in 1932, uh, or cast her first vote in 1932, she voted for FDR because, she said, he seemed the more libertarian of the two candidates. So well, in 1932, yeah, it was a mistake. It was the first of many disappointments <laughs> that she had in, uh, in all kinds of politicians. But it's interesting that, at least according to Barbara Brandon, she did use the word libertarian for herself in 1932 at a time when there were only about half a dozen people in the world who used the word libertarian. In the sense that we use it now more or, in or less. In just about any sense. Um, by the time the libertarian movement and party came up, in the 70s, uh, she had been through so many disappointments in politics uh, that she was na now gun shy. She didn't want to have anything to do with any movements, uh, any parties, uh, and uh, she didn't want to have anything to do with the word libertarian. Okay. Uh, partly because she had uh, she knew some of the people um, involved with it, mainly <laughs> Murray Rothbard, and she had certain major disagreements with Murray Rothbard's theories. And so she uh, I get the herself. impression that if you disagreed with her in any way, shape, or form, she had no use for you. Is that pretty much that correct? Is, uh, that is the case, yes. Almost without exception. There, there are a couple of exceptions, but the, the, the overwhelming rule is 
uh, you had to agree with everything that she said. Well, what was her system and uh, what made it so self-evidently correct in her opinion? Well, uh, the famous story you've probably heard is that she was asked by one of the salesmen at Random House Publishers who published Atlas Shrugged, can you explain your philosophic system while standing on one foot? And she said, metaphysics, objective reality. Epistemology, reason. Ethics, self-interest. Politics, capitalism. And that was her very short summary of her system. A philosophic system is like a four-story building. The first story is metaphysics. Everything rests on that then epistemology, then ethics, then politics. Libertarianism, in my understanding, uh, back when I joined the Libertarian Party in 1972, was that libertarianism was the political system based on the principle that no one has the right to initiate force. And since that principle came from Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged and is the political component of objectivism, my understanding and the understanding of a lot of people then was that libertarianism uh, was uh, simply the extension into politics of, libertari of objectivist philosophy, which works philosophically, but it doesn't, doesn't work that way psychologically. Uh, psychologically, there are people interested in philosophy and there are people interested in politics. And right. never the twain shall meet. Well, and then there are also people who are just interested in a good story. Can you tell us without spoiling it for us, what are her books about generally, um, uh, she in wrote, terms of plot? <clears throat> yeah, um, her first novel, uh, we the Living came out in 1936. She said that's as close to an autobiography as she would ever write. It was based on her own experiences back in Russia uh, during the Russian Revolution. Uh, there was uh, a moment when her family was traveling by train from St. Petersburg to Odessa. Uh, the train uh, was abandoned by its crew and people who have read Atlas Shrugged, that will sound familiar to them because something like that happens toward the end of Atlas Shrugged. That's based on her own experience. Um, the passengers hired villagers to take them into Odessa. Uh, the wagons that they were on were held up by bandits. So little 12-year-old Alyssa, her real name was Alyssa Rosenbaum, uh, was standing there with her family with guns in their backs uh, waiting to be killed any moment. And uh, the uh, bandits relieved them of their uh, jewelry and whatever else and then let them go. Okay. So, and, they, and they literally starved uh, when they got back to St. Petersburg. They, she, she passed out on the street one day from hunger. So she really lived through the worst, or some of the worst, of the Russian Revolution. And that, um, that uh, pretty much scarred her for the rest of her life. It made her uh, a very, very devoted anti-communist for the rest of her life. And uh, the heroes of her books are generally uh, strongly individualistic people. Mm -hmm. Who, um, who shy away from uh, um, bowing to the collective. Is that the idea? Exactly. Uh, her uh, philosophy is about uh, thinking for oneself. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, when some, if people ask me, are you a follower of Ayn Rand, I like to say that Rand was a thinker for whom thinking for yourself is the highest value. So anybody who literally was a follower of Ayn Rand would be no follower of Ayn Rand. You follow okay. me? Except that uh, she did seem to uh, enjoy the adulation of her, uh, well, we can't say the word followers, but they sound like followers to me. Yes, it's very tricky how that worked out. Apparently, uh, I understand some of them even would affect a Russian accent to be more like her. And, uh, that, that did happen, and still happens to this day. Some people are going around saying philosophical because she said philosophical. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, very tricky, and it's fascinating. Um, Barbara Brandon's biography in 1986, The Passion of Ayn Rand, and then three years later, Nathaniel Brandon's memoir, My Years with Ayn Rand, show how this all happened, and um, it snuck up on them. They thought that they were great individualists and could think for themselves independently, but they couldn't because they were so under the spell of this very dynamic personality, and they didn't want to lose that. And right. they knew that if they disagreed with her about anything, out the door. Oh and so goodness. you can fall into well, cultism. Sounds like a bit of a hypocrite then. No, just she just had blinders on. She saw things the way she saw them, and she had no time to consider anything from anybody else's point of view. This is the point that 
Nathaniel Brandon makes. It just wasn't her way to ever take a moment to see anything from the other guy's point of view. No, Nathaniel Brandon was uh, an acolyte of hers and uh, also her, uh, her boyfriend, correct? Yes, he is a psychologist and when he was 19 he wrote her a fan letter and they got into a correspondence and they became friends and um, he introduced his uh, girlfriend uh, Barbara and uh, they were all associated for 18 years. Then they had a tiff, to put it mildly, in 1968 and uh, that was the end of that. Um, but uh, the whole story... But they were both married. Mr. Brandon and Ayn Rand were both married to other people. Right. And they had a, a rather open affair they, for some years, correct? Yeah, uh, that, uh, that's what makes my job as a tour guide kind of uh, fun. And that's why, well, that's one of the reasons that I think that it's at least a, there's a sporting chance that uh, Rand's system of objectivism will become... Uh, the major idea system for the world in the future, okay, precisely because the story is so entertaining right. about her life. You see, that's okay. there are there are philosophers out there who spend their life writing dry tomes. Nobody's going to remember them. Everybody's going to remember the story of Ayn Rand. Okay. Now, the subtitle of your book is "Imagining an Objectivist Future World." Mm -hmm. Trips we gonna off the tongue. Are it? we going to have one? And what's it going to look like? Like I say, it's a sporting uh, proposition. I think there's a uh, there's a reasonable. Uh, uh, chance that that will happen. And if it does, uh, you will see a culture in which the human being, every human being, everywhere in the world from a very early age is encouraged to self-actualize, to uh, uh, pursue Aristotle's idea of the individual cultivating himself, making himself all that he can be. Rather than the altruist um, uh, ideal, which is that you should sacrifice yourself to some supposedly greater cause. Uh, that uh, is the attitude that makes people fly planes into buildings. Uh, that is the attitude that makes people uh, goose step and uh, join, um, uh, follow dictators uh, and fanatics uh, because they've been taught that they should sacrifice their own, their own interest and their independent thought and to some leader. And on a much leader. more local level, it leads to a lot of angry, bitter, passive-aggressive parents. Yes, and a whole host of other problems, too. Mm -hmm. So I would see uh, the age of Rand as a, uh, uh, largely a good thing, um, but there are certain problems that we can anticipate and, uh, and hopefully be ready for them uh, when they occur. And one of them is this problem of... Uh, uh, the tendency of some readers of Rand to uh, follow her prescriptions a little too literally uh, and become cultists. Okay, well give me an example of one or two of her principles that maybe you have your own doubts about. Um, well, one notorious example of that was the issue of a woman president. Uh, in 1967, uh, a uh, magazine asked a number of uh, prominent American women, including Rand, what they would do if they were president. And she said something uh, like, I would never want to be president, and I don't think a woman should ever be president. And that caused a lot of questions uh, from her readers, and so she expanded on this theme in an article uh, about a woman president. I don't think she made a convincing case. Um, her point was that there are women who can do the job, yes, but it would be a very disturbed, mentally disturbed kind of woman who would let herself in for what she would have to go through in her sexual identity, her sexual self-image, to be the president of the dominant nation in the world and to be in a position of authority over all of the men around her. Um, History does not bear her out on this. Uh, I don't are, know. I say she's dead right, but that, <laughs> that's maybe a, an issue we'll have well, to debate on. Well, there are show. there are women uh, I, I think uh, who can uh, who can get over that uh, <laughs> problem. But now, um, if they have a well-adjusted sex life at home with with their husband, uh, like Hillary Clinton, uh, she's not the example that springs <laughs> to mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, one thing that I hear a lot of people objecting to about Ayn Rand. And I'm speaking from ignorance here because I've read very little of her oeuvre, but um, what I've heard people little say... Little of her what? Her oeuvre, her corpus, her oeuvre. everything she's written. Oh, oh. Um, and, I see. Uh, I didn't my, understand you. Okay, well, what I hear from a lot of folks is that uh, 
um, she was totally opposed to um, doing anything for anybody that uh, wasn't exactly in line with where you were going at the time. For example, if you uh, were passing by a child struggling in a creek, you there was no reason for you to, to uh, pull the kid out if it caused you any inconvenience. Is that the truth? No. Uh, that's uh, uh, simply a matter of when you create a new ethical system, it's new to people mm -hmm. and it requires some explanation. Uh, so, no. Um, she was not opposed to help. She was opposed to sacrifice. And she was opposed to sacrifice of anybody to anybody. She was opposed to the idea of sacrificing self to others or others to self. Her point was, why should anybody be sacrificed to anybody? We're all just in this universe and uh, we can make the best of it. What was her line between help and sacrifice? Uh, it's a sacrifice if you are hurting yourself rather than helping the other person. Okay. And that, and this is something I expand on the, in the book, uh, listen carefully to people when they speak. When people are uh, getting moralistic and they're giving you the altruist line, listen to them very, very carefully. And what you find is that they don't care whether you help the other person. They care that you hurt yourself. When you find a way of helping someone else that also helps yourself, they don't care about that. They're not impressed. When you help someone in a way that hurts yourself, you know, that impresses them, even if you don't succeed in helping the other person. That is exactly what I've been saying to educators who say that, uh, who try to re require children to do so-called community service. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that, you know, when they make a kid do quote-unquote volunteer work, yeah, some volunteer, mm -hmm. um, as requirement of graduation, mm -hmm. sometimes a kid will um, do something that not only is helpful to the less fortunate, mm -hmm. but also profitable to himself. Like, for example, he'll mm -hmm. start a business which happens to uh, be of great benefit to mm -hmm. quite a lot of people. Exactly. But the school administrators, in their wisdom, will say, no, that's not good enough. For us, volunteer work is something that causes you inconvenience, that's right. such as taking big rocks and breaking them into small rocks. Yeah. That's volunteer work. Yeah, and that is the logical dead end to altruism that Rand pointed out. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the good news is that it is in, in the, it's in the nature of life that your self-interest is very intimately tied to the self-interest of a lot of other people. Simple example, I'm a tour guide in New York City. If people in Ethiopia are poor, there are not going to be very many tourists coming to New York City uh, to take my tours from Ethiopia. If Ethiopia does well, I do well. So I see Rand's uh, self-interest ethics ethic or egoism is another word for it, as being a, uh, a system that unites the interests of different pre people, whereas the altruist is splitting your interest from the other person. Okay. So what would an objectivist society look like? What, for example, would our government look like? Very small. And this is where I uh, bring in the, my other favorite subject, the American Revolution. On my tours, I take people to Federal Hall on Wall Street, and I show them a picture of the original building, which is not the one there now, and I say, this is the little two-story building that in 1789 held the entire U.S. federal government, 175 people. And the army out on the frontier, 600 men. That's it. Uh, Murray Rothbard, I mentioned him, uh, the big argument between Rand and Rothbard was that Rand was for reducing government drastically, and Rothbard said, no, it's not enough to reduce government. It has to be extirpated root and branch, or else it will grow back like a cancer. Well, the amount of government that the United States had at its beginning was so small that most people would have a hard time discerning it from pure anarchism. And yet it grew. And it grew. It took a while, though. But now we have, we know a lot more than they did back then. Uh, we know um, uh, the uh, uh, economic principles taught by the Austrian School of Economics, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek. We know more about how the free market works. And so we can make a better case okay. than the founders did. Well, let me uh, ask the question that any good liberal would ask. 
What would happen to all the poor folks in an objectivist society? They would cease to be poor because they would be able to make money. Uh, it is government that makes us poor. Four ways. First, through regulation, they don't let you make money. Second, through taxation, they take your money away from you. Third, through inflation, they destroy the value of what money you do have. And uh, how many was that? Three? Uh, what was the fourth one? I, um, well, they borrow. Well, that's the other thing. They, uh, government borrows uh, money, and they borrow so much of the money that is in the banks to be borrowed that there is very little for the rest of us to borrow, except at very high interest rates. Uh, take away these activities of government, and people will be making money. Uh, that's where, too, uh, another thing that I plug in my book and a, a very interesting and exciting new field in economics these days is microcredit, microloans. Uh, there is a man in Bangladesh uh, named uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus, an economist who in the 70s started a little tiny bank to make little tiny loans to little tiny businesses. That is what I would like to see more of throughout the world. Little tiny new businesses, lots of millions of new entrepreneurs getting little loans to start little businesses that grow. Okay. That's a very exciting new field. It does sound exciting to me, but uh, how are we going to do it? You know darn well the government's going to put a stop to it. Oh, no, they're not going to put a stop to it. They're going to co-opt it because well, they'll regulate. In, in Eunice's book, uh, who does he have pictures of himself standing next to but Bill and Hillary Clinton? Mm. You see, so so uh, sooner or later it will be taken over and made into a government department that does the job badly. Because right. that, that's what politics does. How do you prevent this? How do we go about <clears throat> achieving this uh, objectivist society if that is indeed what we want? How, do you have a plan for it? How long is it going to take? Uh, in one word, argumentation. That's all. Uh, how long will it take? I don't know. Uh, in my book I talk about the next 50 to 100 years. Okay. Uh, beyond that, the, the, the crystal ball darkens. Okay. Well, speaking of argumentation, if you uh, want to know more about libertarianism and objectivism and have something to argue about at the next cocktail party, then I would advise you to uh, tune in to the website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party, and that is www.manhattanlp.org. And there you will... Um, find out how you can join the Manhattan Libertarian Party, you'll find out the basic principles of libertarianism, and you will find links to um, state and national libertarian organizations. Once again, that's www.manhattanlp.org. And we are constantly working for that objectivist society about which my guest Frederick uh, Cookenham has written in his book, The Age of Rand. So. Um, Rand is still regarded as a sort of a, a subject, an object of worship um, mm -hmm. some, by some folks. Mm -hmm. um, do you suppose that um, there will be a, a Rand monument uh, in Washington, D.C. when they... Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, she said, uh, I don't want a, a statue in a park a hundred years after I'm dead and it won't do me any good. But someday, I suppose somebody will uh, put up a statue of Rand and there will probably be streets named after Rand and maybe cities named Rand. Uh, I would uh, imagine that if the age of Rand does come, it will, a lot of it will take place in space. Uh, I think that um, uh, we are only just barely uh, beginning to see man's future in space. Okay, now uh, Robert Heinlein wrote uh, an interesting little novel about the possibilities of uh, um, a, a libertarian society or a quasi-libertarian society on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, were he and Rand associated with each other? Did they know each other? Did they work together at all? No, I have no, I've never heard of any contact between them, but the novel that you are referring to is called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Uh, he wrote that in 1966, and it mentions Rand. Uh, the hero is asked. Uh, uh, That's right. He, 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 the hero was talking about his libertarian ideas, and uh, somebody says, "This sounds like Randianism," and he says, "Well, I can get along with a Randian." Right. Uh, so uh, I recall that line very yeah. well. A uh, lot of libertarians, a lot of objectivists, are also science fiction fans. Uh huh. So I've noticed. Uh, why do you suppose that an objectivist society would uh, occur in outer space? because that's where your grandchildren are going to live. And the reason for that is very simple. In space, you find the, th the, the two things that you need to build a civilization, raw materials and energy. 
Okay. Uh, the sun provides the, the energy, and uh, the, uh, the moons and asteroids of the solar system uh, provide the raw materials. Of course, the living spaces in outer space would probably be ultimately put together by the government, correct? Whether we like it or not. Uh, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. Uh, if you could sum up objectivism in a couple of sentences. Hmm. Uh, standing on one foot? <laughs> I'm no, sitting there. You're sitting, and that's right, fine. So. Um, the way I like to put it is uh, that in metaphysics, or ontology is the word that they use these days, uh, we learn that everything that exists has a nature, and everything has to act according to its nature. Well, man's nature is that he thinks. That's his tool of survival. And when you think, you have to then um, carry out your thoughts in practice, and that, uh, to make a long story short, is free enterprise. Uh, when you act to keep yourself alive and maximize your choices in the future, uh, that is, that is um, uh, enterprise, and it is located in the individual. He is the one who has to make the decisions and live with the consequences. Um, and he needs to be free to do so. And um, uh, as he should not sacrifice self to others, nor sacrifice others to self, uh, so he should not initiate force against others or let others initiate force against him. Okay, so in an objectivist society, if somebody wanted to be altruistic and wanted to live life for others, then they would not be stopped, correct? Correct. We would argue against uh, that uh, person. We would point out to the consequences uh, of his actions. You know, Rand's favorite expression was, check your premises and watch your implications. She was always like a chess player thinking three or four steps ahead. Think of the consequences of your actions. Think of the implications. Think of the unintended side consequences. It's a very good skill to develop in a young person. Uh, but she would ever, would she ever admit that there were unintended consequences to any of her uh, premises? Uh, unintended consequences, she would admit that they existed, but she would see them all as positive if you interpreted and understood her ideas correctly. Uh -huh. And that, I suppose, is a good line to go out on because that is pretty much true of anybody who uh, has their own uh, little uh, personal philosophy or code as uh, Ayn Rand did. So uh, well, thank you very much, Frederick Cookenham, and good thank luck you. promoting your book, The Age of Rand. Mm -hmm. And join us next week for another half hour of Hardfire. <laughs>